a studio uh, called Umschichten. Um, how, how do you translate Umschichten? Is it re repiling? Into English? No. Uh, uh, yes, but maybe also we just say um, Umschichten. <laughs> <laughs> Umschichten. Um, yes, uh, so it's Umschichten. Umschichten, um, I met, uh, or they, they generously um, enriched my life with the term of uh, that I already told you, I think, the uh, day before, the pre-cycling. This idea that uh, you can not only tap into the, the, the sort of the, the, the life cycles of the things that are produced in society after they are used as this recycling or repurposing that we are very familiar with, but that you can that you have a full circle to look at of uh, a material metabolism, and that you can also um, you can choose a point where you want to enter this circle or try to find entries into this circle. And pre-cycling means basically using elements that are being produced before they find their so-called final purpose or like longer-term purpose. And I think this was a super interesting. Um, you know, idea, but also constraint to uh, for a designer to not just look at the world and say everything. I can choose everything, and then I draw a form, and then uh, you know whatever it needs to materialize, we 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 assemble. But we take things as given uh, that we can uh, access, um, and we work from that. Uh, so please welcome Alpa from Umschichten uh, for the second lecture of the night. Thank you, Marcus. <laughs> Thank you for the lecture also. I think uh, everything I was just going to say. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> the kind of the, um, the pointe was just um, taken. But um, no, I can maybe emphasize. <laughs> in one way, we call it a um, pre cycling, which is very kind of like in a terminal. Uh, just a terminology which people can really relate to really quickly, of course. But also, we tend to call it sometimes just the formula, which is uh, kind of shown in this diagram right here. Um, and the letters are, of course, just randomly picked from the alphabet. Um, and basically, it shows kind of this, this pre-cycling formula. And uh, we start here, of course, at A, and which is kind of the, this is kind of the process the material is taking throughout this um, uh, process of um, the pre-cycling. So the material starts, it's kind of in its, in its virgin state, and there is a kind of desire which brings it basically to a, to a new stage, which we call kind of like the base camp. When, we, when you look at it, of course, you see like these alpine, alpine uh, motives. So um, base camp, before you approach the summit, you kind of collect the materials, you clear up the desire where you want to go. And uh, on this moment of reaching uh, this point B, something magical can happen or something surprising can happen. That doesn't always happen, but can happen. So that's why it's kind of shrouded in the clouds. You never know if it's, if it's going to happen. And that kind of can elevate the whole situation or the material or the the the, um, the working with the material to this kind of fantastical up in the air over the sun point of point C but which is the the very important part of this whole process of course is that the material is returning back to its original state as Marcus already uh, said and uh, has of course still, a change, a change has happened to the material in that it has gained, or we have gained, or the people that were uh, involved in this whole process have gained some experience and some knowledge about using a certain material or also maybe a space or some kind of uh, urban surrounding. So um, I will start really quickly to illustrate maybe this idea on a quite um, easygoing project, simple project. Uh, which is called uh, Full Body Contact, which was an exhibition in uh, a small gallery in Reutlingen, which is a city close to Stuttgart, where we are also based. And um, 
in the context of this exhibition, we just wanted, we had to, we were invited just to do something with a very classical gallery space. Um, and we wanted to take this opportunity to also uh, reflect, of course, a little bit on our practice, because usually we are not invited to this very kind of classical exhibition um, formats, really. Um, that's why also, as it is with these exhibitions, you also get the chance to to publish some kind of small booklet or uh, some kind of a small publication. Um, and we uh, made this poster, which was on the one side, it had, of course, all the information and the name of the exhibition. And on the other side, it kind of collects um, all of the, the aspects that are important in our work. So here you also have the, the kind of the diagram you just saw in different versions, it can also it's never quite the same the way that it works. It can also be a big spiral and uh, a labyrinth with, without many, um, without an exit. Um, but maybe just to go into some of these kind of um, statements that are important in our work and that, that I will also keep talking about throughout the presentation is um, maybe to translate one that is very important for us, uh, bauen hört nicht auf, building never stops. So it's kind of this, um, this process of um, exercising with the material to understand it as an ongoing process that doesn't have an end really. So it's really speculative um, spatial practice, which is also always ready, but also never ready. This is another um, aspect. Material in flux, trial and error, the building as, an, as, a, as a happening basically, which um, is there in one situation, in one configuration, in one moment, and then completely changed in the next moment. And also, what I heard one of the workshops also um, is kind of working on maybe uh, to see uh, building materials, uh, not just kind of in the classical sense that you look at uh, materials that that will be that would be usually used, but that you under try to understand also maybe here it's a good example. Uh, Parts of a of a of an unused plane or or uh, used cars or all these kinds of things as materials and try to just find an approach and take care how to use them. Um, what did I forget? Oh, what what is what what what's come nach fertig? What happens after a project is done with materials? Also one that I really like. Um, Okay, maybe to continue, not to take too much time. In this project, um, we uh, one thing we always do, we ask the, the people that invite us if they have some connections to material so sources. So for institutions, sometimes they have sponsors or for cities, there is some company or uh, in the neighborhood, there is a business or some, this could be any of these. So uh, in this case, we asked the museum and they said, yeah, well, we have this company that we work with for many years and they provide us with these walls, um, these movable walls that uh, we use to set up our exhibitions. And so we said, oh, that's great. Maybe we can set up a meeting. So we met and basically we just borrowed uh, a bunch of these panels that um, they produce uh, very quickly out of kind of aluminum profiles and they um, produce them in a variety of colors and sell them really worldwide. So they had a huge hangar full of these and we basically just borrowed a truckload. It was kind of like a uh, switching process of uh, using, um, being on site, touching the material, feeling it, then testing, testing what's possible also in terms of the connections because when you use borrowed materials, of course, you also have to take care of how you attach them together in a way that they are unhurt and they, you can also give them back to the to the owners. So this was kind of like just kind of, um, it, it becomes a process of uh, kind of playing with the material, finding out what's possible. Uh, yeah, continuing. The Office 1.0 3.0. Um, I'm going to talk about our office in Stuttgart, which uh, where the office, oh, let me sit down, uh, where we, uh, where the office was founded in 2008, in the context of uh, Wagenhalle, which is a unused hangar for um, train repairs, um, and 
in since two, 2004 it has been used by a group of artists and by now it has become turned into a into an art foundation and has been renovated and throughout this whole process um, the, our office has been there and has kind of adapted to all of these transformations that happen to to the site so the first version of the office was basically just this shelf this industrial shelf which we found in the in this hangar which was just left there kind of by the company that repaired the the trains um, and so what we basically just did is um, make a staircase out of these crates uh, that you see here um, and put a box on top of the of the of this shelf um, so these are the three versions um, yeah here you see again basically uh, on the left side it was the original shelf as we found it and then the with the box on top it became uh, the office uh, yeah so you could still use the shelf as a storage which we also did for models and materials and all these things and the o box on top was also built out of uh, unused um, fair stand by Mercedes-Benz of course in Stuttgart um, yeah this is kind of the in inside look and uh, after some years, there was a change in the in the hangar. Um, there's an event space also in this in in this in this in this building, and they had to um, redesign some of their spaces for fire safety. So we had to move the office because the new concrete wall for fire safety uh, was basically built just through the through the site where our old office was standing. So we kind of just pulled uh, the the um, as you can see here on, on the top image, we kind of separated the, the shelf into kind of slices and put them on rolls and then just pulled them 30 meters to the left throughout the hangar and added basically some more material. So now you would have these three slices and you could, uh, we filled the in-between, put a facade around it and then also built like kind of this courtyard to extend a little bit the space and um, and have a more a bigger variety of uses possible. And here you see a little bit the facade. Also, the these um, the facade was made from these blue crates that we got from a recycling yard, which was our neighbor for many years. Here you see Lucas and Peter using different kinds of mobility. This is the inside exactly of the of this variation of this office. So you you're not sitting anymore now in the shelf, but kind of at the shelf. And then um, the decision was taken by the city to fund a big renovation of the hangar and basically to keep it be because of course, like it is with these kinds of spaces, it was for many years also uh, not clear for how long we would be able to stay there. Um, but with this decision, it also mean meant that everybody had to move out of the hangar um, for many years, for five years now, uh, we just moved back in. And this also meant for us that we would take this opportunity to, to dismantle the shelf completely because um, it had to fit through the door. So here you see also tests that we were doing while we were dismantling the hangar um, to already figure out a new construction method on how we could build the new uh, shelf outdoors so there was one team of us dismantling the shelf on the one side and on at the same time we were trying to figure out how to construct a new one outside so um, on the outside we added another element that came from uh, another project this uh, which were these four containers and a um, heavy heavy storage shelf and this is the an indoor view of the office and uh, yeah, here, here, here you can see basically that now the shelf has kind of transformed its um, its function. It, fu it functions more as a structural element for the roof and the sides. And inside you have a kind of this um, hull, this climate, climate hull. And um, 
underneath these four containers have four functions for storage, a shower, and a sauna, and a kitchen. And they also serve, of course, as, a, as the funda foundations for this whole structure. And this way, it's still standing right now, but we are currently this whole uh, container city where the where the office is situated at is kind of at risk right now. So we are slowly starting to move back indoors. And here you see um, kind of the a fantastic um, fantastical uh, visualization of this process that I was talking about earlier that we're kind of uh, constructing, deconstructing on the one side while adding and constructing on the other side so to understand kind of these buildings as, a, as an ongoing process more than kind of a one finished version or these three versions, but it's more kind of a, uh, uh, a thing that's always in transition. Um, maybe quickly I'll go through this project. We were invited to Wiener Festwochen Festival in Vienna um, to build a, their festival center. And again, there we wondered about which material would be adequate. We talked a lot with the, uh, with the organizers, of course, about the spatial needs and all these classical processes. But um, quickly we found uh, a supplier that was close by for these um, drywall profiles that all of you probably know. And we borrowed them, so uh, the process again started to figure out, okay, how can we use them in a way that they are really unhurt? And I don't know if you, if you have worked with these, you know that they are quite fragile in, in their own way um, and have their caveats in using them. So again, there was kind of a, a process of testing and retesting and visualizing using different tools, the computer physically, uh, in reality, one-to-one -one tests. And um, we set up a, a workshop on site in Vienna and just had all these materials. And you see uh, producing, for example, different packages or thinking about uh, there on the right side how to cover the sharp edges so the visitors of the festival wouldn't uh, hurt themselves or destroy their clothes. So it's kind of this, you have to uh, treat the, the materials that you're using with the kind of different kind of focus and, um, and affection maybe. Yeah, some more in indoor views. There was a little sauna, so we also built a situation for this. Uh, hammam, sorry. Um, then another aspect of our work that sometimes uh, that we sometimes are get involved in is a participatory process in urban development. This was in Köln, Korweiler, um, where we were invited by Urban Catalyst to participate participate in a in a uh, in a participation process. And you can see here, basically, it's kind of showing the the and the project in context. So it's kind of this um, high-rise uh, area in Cologne, and we kind of built this uh, Platzstation, as we call it. And it was um, also, maybe you can recognize, we brought, again, some of the parts of the, of the office, so containers and shelves, and these, um, these domes that are used to make underground windows. Uh, and so we had a kitchen and a workshop with us at this time. And it was basically just a, a place to gather and bring in people and cook and uh, come into conversations and host different formats. And also at the same time, while it's already in use, to keep constructing it also with the people on site. So you see here, of course, the local children were very keen on, on climbing up and helping out, and it was also used by, by the people of, of Urban Catalyst to do the different formats of, um, of planning and gathering ideas and hosting different rounds, and also to, um, to act quickly and directly was an aspect uh, in this project that was very important, so um, people would come up with suggestions and um, we would think about with them together how to um, turn them into reality very quickly, so um, 
this also meant, for example, there were children that wanted to have a, a soccer field, so we um, brought our materials onto a neighboring patch of grass and basically just quickly built a, 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 um, a temporary soccer patch just to kind of visualize this need and test these, these areas for these kinds of uses. Um, we also built kind of these, uh, this huge model which was used to um, place and um, make these ideas and desires more concrete, which was also used to discuss, of course, more. And this was then kind of turned into a, an exhibition on site, which was also used, built from the same materials, from the same material pool, which was repeatedly used. Um, Another project, Trägerleger, we were invited to Dessau to the Bauhaus um, to do this exhibition design for this, um, this exhibition, um, Große Pläne. Um, again, we went on the hunt for a material and we quickly found this uh, fantastic uh, and very euphoric um, resales person of these kinds of um, building materials, specifically plastic materials, pipes, um, and uh, canals. And uh, he was very um, keen on this idea of, of the pre-cycling. He really enjoyed this idea and thought it was fantastic. And this is definitely also an aspect this is which is very important in our work, that we have to always talk to the people and uh, put a lot of effort in building a, um, a relationship of trust where they also understand what we want to do and why we want to use these materials in this way and that they will also, um, uh, that there won't be a disadvantage for them in the end um, of this process. So after clearing the, the materials, we set up a workshop inside of the museum and started working on different um, models to kind of clear the spatial situation and at the same time also making a kind of inventory of all the things that we had as a as a setting or set that we were w that we could work with um, and then kind of using this knowledge to prototype on site different um, connection methods um, that leave the materials of course again unharmed so um, clamps um, uh, belts ratchets all these things and as Marcus already said before all these um, um, these act uh, aspects or factors also create a certain aesthetic of course because when you're not uh, allowed to, uh, to cut into the material or drill a hole it immediately of course creates a uh, other kind of um, boundaries that you have to address them. So here we just were testing all these different possibilities to use the material and slowly approaching through like prototypings um, different ways to use these things, slowly giving them a function also. <laughs> Oop. And basically this is um, kind of the overview of the exhibition space in the end, um, which was more or less all made from these materials that we borrowed. Um, so these pipes, and you see kind of the, like it, w it was a very kind of complex visual <laughs> um, uh, situation. Also these aluminum, pi uh, aluminum plates were also from this borrowed from the same supplier. Yeah. So also, um, as you can see here, it's also um, we are not hiding this construction methods or these connections, and um, uh, it's something that is a necessity when you're using these materials in this way, some things that you would m maybe uh, wanna would want to hide, they become very visible and this is also a uh, aspect that we enjoy in our work a lot. Um, 
another maybe quickly uh, community project in Essen um, where we in, were invited to work in the context of the um, Grüne Hauptstadt, Green Capital, it is called, uh, kind of a EU project. Um, and we were kind of, um, our site was brought to a, a certain type of fish that used to live in a, in a river in the Ruhr Valley, um, which thought was, it was to be extinct because uh, this river was so polluted by the um, coal and iron in industry in this area. Um, but it uh, magically survived the many years of um, ecological turmoil. And so we um, decided to build a, um, a monument for this, for this animal. Um, and the way that we approached this also, again, thinking from the material, um, was that we, uh, together with the organizer of the uh, Green Capital, um, uh, that organized that uh, kindergartens and schools would uh, collect all the plastic bags that they had at their houses from their p families to have them, of course, replaced by reusable bags and that we would workshop with the, with the kids to build this memorial from all these bags. So it was kind of a very um, fun way to work with these little kids and they <laughs> really kind of, um, of course, um, for them it was uh, again um, very easy to, to understand this, this concept that what they where they brought this material from, what they kind of how they processed it, and then how we together attached it as part of this of this uh, installation. Um, yeah, to maybe I think this is the the last one. I hope you guys are still are you still alive? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, Super Bob, I think maybe my favorite project because of the extremely high intensity that was involved in it. Um, it started all out, we were involved, uh, invited to Hamburg by the Hamburg-based artist duo Baltic Raw, Bernd Jasper and Mokka Farkas, um, who had a, a temporary museum outside of the Hamburger Kunsthalle. Uh, and we were basically invited at the end of the of the exhibition duration to dismantle this temporary museum, which was a wooden wooden structure, and to come up with something that we could do during this dismantling or this deconstruction process. So what we thought, again, uh, fr from our fetish for materials, we thought, okay, we just take it because uh, maybe if, if you know Hamburger Kunsthalle, it has this, um, the cut pyramid uh, in front of it. So there's kind of this public uh, um, tab tablet in front of the museum. And um, we said, okay, we will just take it apart and then kind of spread out all the materials like a big um, um, Schlachtplatte. <laughs> and um, so we that's where we started. And uh, here you see a, a picture of this, of this of part of the structure and when we started we quickly realized well no actually um, we we want to add another factor to this to this exhibition because we always saw a lot of people sliding down on the sides of this um, of this architecture and so we thought okay maybe we have to just build a big slide and so um, this all happened kind of in the mean meantime of one one afternoon, we start came up with this idea and then just put all the effort, everybody stopped dismantling kind of this, this structure and we just kind of picked the necessary materials from it and started quickly building this um, huge bobsled that went from the top of this, uh, of this architecture down and down, to in, uh, down the staircase. And uh, while we were building it, the technical director of the museum came out and was um, had no words for what was happening, but um, we uh, talked to him and said that we would 
take it apart the next day <laughs> and uh, after uh, conversations and testing and sending him down the slide and all these things um, again we built the trust also to him and um, were able to use it for one afternoon and had a fantastic um, uh, time there and just recently actually I was at a uh, at a different project and um, we were talking to there were some people in a meeting from the municipality um, close in Dortmund and um, one guy because I also showed this project and he said ah it's nice that I finally meet you because this project has given us uh, many sleepless nights in our municipality because we always wondered <laughs> how this is possible that this was ha this, that this happens in, in Hamburg and how we can also be so flexible in our municipality to in to make these things possible little did he know that we never asked anybody to do it ah yeah here you see people sliding down yes um, and maybe I want to I will close with this little um, emblem that we came up with uh, two years ago because we always w were talking about um, the the way that we use the materials and um, the kind of care that we take for them and we wanted to make like a, um, a stamp of, of approval of using materials in this in this way so we put different aspects of course this um, this formula I talked about in the beginning already and then the the years uh, we put to kind of symbolize that we don't only understand this material uh, in its current form but also with all the past that it's had and also with its future that it might has so it's kind of in, in transition and um, then we wanted to write something like um, approved affection for materials and we put it in German and it sounded really terrible and uh, very kind of bland and and boring and so we thought maybe it could be Italian but I hope there's no Italian speakers <laughs> here <laughs> because I, I'm told that in Italian it means something completely different than we were actually were meant to but still attestato effetto materiali thank you Oopsie. Uh, thank you so much for this presentation. Um, and I think it was super interesting to see <coughs> also how elements of trust and care um, are very important uh, and crucial in your practice. Um, and to, to see this like abundance of creativity applied to things that already have a sort of fixed purpose um, and this joy of abuse in a certain sense um, to bring, you know, things that are built to become a canal uh, or something else into a completely different, let's say, reading, uh, functionality, spatiality, um, because I think it opens a lot of imaginaries um, of, you know, if this is possible, what else could be possible? And you very beautifully described this with the story from the slide um, and, the, and, and, the, and the people from... Right, Dortmund? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that, ha that suddenly became, uh, started to have Hamburg desires. <laughs> <laughs> and I think this is, a, this is a super strong power also in these temporary projects that uh, they, they also tackle, you know, a, this kind of boundaries that we're interested in of like, okay, this is possible or this is not possible. This is, this is what it's meant to be um, and to find, and it finds a way to reinterpret. Um, but really, I think, I mean, you were now focusing on the sort of design work a lot. Um, what I marvel is first the research, like how do you find this material? Um, and second, how do you convince these people? Because only it in, the, in the end, it's not like you can, it's not like Amazon, no? Clicking, ordering, paying, that's a procedure we all know. Uh, also for many other online companies, but to get uh, you know some this kind of orange bits, uh, there is no prescribed procedure, um, and I think this is a I don't know if that's a sort of company secret, but <laughs> 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 how
how do you do that? How do you convince people? How long does it take? Um, is this like 90% of the work and then the design is just uh, quickly done? Or mm, you know, No, it's not 90% of the work, but of course it's a big um, part also of um, you're really able to locate yourself in a place by doing this kind of research and by um, moving around and by talking to people. And of course, the way that it works, how you build trust in, in, all, in any other situation is by talking to the people, right? Also because it's, a, it's really a, a big part is translating. You know, many of these people don't have any con contact with the kind of um, work that we do or also don't understand exactly how you say why you would want to do that if you say we want to build an exhibition out of these pipes they'd say like why don't you use this other thing you know it's much better to do to use this um, and so to have these conversations and to also maybe be redirected and um, also especially with this guy in Dessau somehow have this mo reach this moment where it sparks the passion in this in this person and suddenly he calls you and he's like well i got i found this other thing also don't you want to use this as well and um um so it, i i don't think there's a, a kind of a fixed recipe it helps that we have images to show and examples to give kind of to make them kind of understand ah, okay this is what you're doing and then it's like some projects are more relatable or maybe to to these people to, <laughs> to 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 these kind of uh, uh, people also absurd and then funny and that kind of and makes the situation kind of easy going and uh, builds the trust yeah yeah, that, that's actually a beautiful connection also to the text from this morning because in the end paragraph uh, it comes to the question of sin and unsin, like s making sense or nonsense and that also making nonsense can be a way to kind of question these existing paradigms and, and fixed structures um, you know, by placing something outside. But let's open for questions. Is there, is there a comment or a question? Maybe first was this side. Maybe I go to that side. Maybe I do it sort of geographically, sort of slowly walking over. Um, who wants to say something? When is mm. dessert? Is maybe the question. Huh? Dessert is cancelled. Uh, we have plenty of time to keep <laughs> talking. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. So this side wins. <laughs> it's just about one of the pictures you showed of a community group working with materials and like exploding the place that they live in on a map on the floor. And how do you encourage people to use materials that you provide freely or to allow people to understand that they don't have to use materials in the way that they've seen them being used before? Because obviously to designers, that's maybe easier to understand, but when you're working with non-designers, how do you allow people that like freedom? Is it by showing them first or does that influence them too much to do what you just did? Sorry. I mean, this is for sure a, a completely different um, big part of, of the work, which needs a lot of attention, of course, that you, um, when you start involving um, people in, the, in, in this process, like in the that you're talking about, which is really kind of about, um, you know, placing their wishes and desires on this map and then visualizing them in this way and um, for them kind of just to have something that's physical and could be anything so in the picture you saw there was also like water bottles because we just had water bottles and we could put them kind of as a serial uh, model for for lighting or something you know and uh, when you tell them then uh, when you talk with them about it and then say let's put those here it's already enough um, but you have to go along with this process of course and um, in other situations where it's more kind of about constructing together 
Um, this is definitely also sometimes uh, uh, at the same time a possibility, a big kind of possibility, uh, or a, big, a, a lot of possibilities open up, but also it's a big challenge that you have to kind of consider when you invite uh, just the public to 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 contribute to the to the designing process, because I think it's very quick that they that they will start taking things and uh, being passionate about it and being energetic and stuff, but also kind of <laughs> um, to make it as you just said not to kind of make it completely s senseless and uh, I guess also destructive. This is probably a kind of the big challenge that they would start. Um, we had it one time in Jena in a project where we were working also, kids were allowed to just come and, and construct kind of furnitures and there were kids who were just kind of drilling holes, you know, <laughs> and kind of went into a drilling mania for, for 30 minutes, which is fine, but also it doesn't kind of really further the process. Yeah, so it's a different challenge. <laughs> Thank you. That's a very beautiful image you you, <laughs> you give us. Um, <laughs> um, no, I think it's also super interesting this this kind of value question that is attached to the work. No, like uh, I think we're all trained or kind of we're part of a culture that is very efficiency oriented, very functionalist, um, and a lot of uh, the mom or m many times we're confronted with the question, "What is this good for?" Like always assuming that an action uh, has an immediate linear answer um, what it might be good for and I think I'm, I would be super curious to be a mouse in your design process we you know, like you have a super boring material and how do you free yourself from seeing you know piles of drywall stands as drywall but to see something completely different and I think this is uh, super amazing uh, thank you very much for this talk. Thank you. Um, there I'm sure there's plenty more questions, but they will have to be asked uh, individually as Alper is still around. Um, thank you.